Today I want to talk with you guys about two power tools that are so important in our shop that if you come to one of our workshops, you're going to be using them on the very first day. Hey everybody, this is Matt. We're at Texas Toast Guitars. Thanks for watching. We've been doing a lot of videos with clickbait titles just to kind of see what YouTube likes. And I thought, you know what let's do? Let's, uh, let's go back to our roots a little bit and let's talk about some uh, power tools and let's just kind of uh, get rid of all the stuff where we talk about different guitar companies. And uh, let, let's go back and do what we do best and that's uh, talk about and show you guys videos about making guitars and some of the tools that, uh, that we use to do that. In fact, um, I want to show you guys some tools that are so important to us, like I said, that uh, uh, if you come out to one of our workshops, you are going to be using them on the very first day. Those tools, of course, are the bandsaw and the pin router. Now, these are two super important, super valuable tools to us. They're invaluable to us. I would be shocked if any guitar shop in the world didn't have a bandsaw. Um, and I think that uh, while the pin router is being phased out for uh, computer numerically controlled tools, I think that a lot of you guys still really, really dig the pin router. I know I do. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, let's, let's take a couple of minutes um, and talk about what each tool does. And then I want to show you guys some tips and tricks and some techniques so that you can, um, uh, you can use your bandsaw if you have one, which you should, and your pin router if you have one, which you should, but even if you don't, it might be really cool uh, for when you come out to one of our workshops to kind of get you up to speed a little bit and, and show you what uh, what's happening. So, all right, let's jump in. First, we're going to talk about the bandsaw. Let's go check one out. So whether you have a great big bandsaw or even a very small bandsaw, very small bandsaw, they, they all work the same. They all have a blade that is a big loop or band and they look a little bit like this. <clears throat> um, and it goes all the way around through the cut and then back out um, through the mechanism over here. So unlike a circular saw blade that cuts through the piece and then drags the blade back through the other side, the bandsaw only cuts through the piece one direction and the blade actually is out of the cut when it makes its, its loop back around. Let me show you what I mean. So the actual cutting part of the bandsaw blade is in fact this blade right here. <clears throat> and you'll notice the teeth are pointing down and the blade goes down and cuts through the, um, uh, your workpiece. <clears throat> then, ah, boy, excuse the dust, you guys. We're right in the middle of a workshop. <laughs> then the blade comes travels over these wheels here, back the other side. It comes up and over this wheel here. You can see it right here. And you can see it upside down. This is coming back around and up and back down again. So the, the, the blade only cuts right here and then the saw the saw blade re makes its return well outside of the cut okay so um, that's kind of a bandsaw basic right there and that's one of the things that makes the bandsaw such a safe tool to use no kickback so the bandsaw can remove a lot of material very quickly but it can also do so very precisely um, our bandsaws are equipped with a fence and you can use this kind of like, uh, just like you would on your table saw. Um, and if your bandsaw blade is set up properly and it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, wide enough, or thick enough rather, um, you can make cuts that are very, very straight, rivaling, um, well, I'm not gonna say rivaling even a table saw, but, <laughs> but you can get really, really close. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, there is a, <coughs> Uh, a kind of a blade guard that you can set to make sure that you're um, you're only exposing the the blade that you need um, so you can imagine if you're using a big block of lumber like this you might need to have the blade guard set higher than you would if you're doing say a body blank 
to adjust the bandsaw blade guard on our, on our bandsaws and probably most others, you need to loosen this lock. And then there's a crank here that raises and lowers the blade guard. Once you get it set to the height that you want, go ahead and retighten the lock. To adjust the tension of the bandsaw blade, you use this crank right here. And what it does is it raises and lowers this idler uh, wheel um, and tightens the blade. This little pointer here is supposed to be for different sizes of blades. Quarter inch would be, doesn't need quite as much tension as, um, uh, as say a, a one inch blade. I never use that. I always actually check the tension of the blade and I know what it's supposed to be like. Um, so yeah, you need to fit the blade for, um, for each application. The bandsaw is equipped with a dust port. Actually, this one has two one at the top and one on the bottom. As you can see, we rarely, if ever, use them. Um, but I encourage you to do so. What happens is we get in these workshops and guys get real, real excited about using tools and they forget about dust collection until it's a little too late. So don't forget about dust collection, get it going right away. Um, your tools, if they're equipped with a dust port, <laughs> do yourself a favor, use the dust port. This particular bandsaw has a quarter inch blade. That means that the distance from the teeth to the back of the blade is one quarter of an inch. I like that for making really tight cuts, tight corners and things like that. This bandsaw has a three eighths blade. So from the tip of the blade to the back of the blade is three eighths. I think that's probably the most versatile um, uh, dimension bandsaw blade that there is. You can make some fine cuts, you can make some tight turns, not as tight as with the quarter, and you can even do some resawing if you have a really excellent blade. This is probably the workhorse size for us. So generally you wanna match the bandsaw blade to uh, the, the project that you're doing. If you're doing a lot of tight cuts, uh, a lot of tight corners, like I said, a thinner, a thinner blade like this would be good. If you're doing a lot of resawing, do yourself a favor and get one that's, that's uh, like an inch, uh, the biggest one you can get. Uh, I think this one we, we can go up to an inch. Um, resaw blades are, um, if you go to a sawmill, resaw blades are three inches, something like that, and they are uh, uh, super, super big. Um, like I said, for what we do, the, 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 the workhorse for us is three eighths. Now when you buy bandsaw blades, you're gonna see things like regular, skip, and hook tooth. And what that is, is let's see if we can get this in the picture here. That's just the way that the teeth look. So the regular blade looks like this. The skip tooth is it actually skips one of those blades. And the hook tooth is just a different, different. Um, let's see if we can get in the picture there. It's just a little different style of, of blade. They each have their own um, advantages. For everyday use, I like the skip tooth. Um, but you know, the regular works good and, and hook works, works really great too. You might wanna try each one of those out. Bandsaw blades, especially these Sterrett blades, I'm not getting paid to show you guys this. We use a bunch of these Sterrett blades. Um, they work great and they're not particularly expensive. I think this one was like, like 20, 24 bucks or something. You need to remember to match the bandsaw blade length to your bandsaw. This one is a 133 inch, that's the length of the, of the band. And the other bandsaw over there is a 1 and 11, a 111 inch. So 131 inches, 111 inches. Uh, your bandsaw is going to be all whatever your bandsaw is. And um, so, but the, the, if you have a bandsaw blade that is, you know, that's too long or too short for your bandsaw, sorry, you can't use it. Um, we had some people that were asking me, hey, do you want these bandsaw blades? I'm like, I probably can't use them unless you know exactly if they're 111 or 133, whatever, whatever this one is, I can't remember. So remember, buy bandsaw blades for a couple of good reasons. One, gotta fit your tool, and two, you wanna match the application that you're using. Uh, like I say, you're doing a bunch of, uh, of tight, tight radiuses, you wanna have probably something like a quarter inch blade. Doing a bunch of resaw, the bigger the better. Um, you want just the most utility you can get. Like I say, I like 3 eighths. So try them out, see what you think. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about what a bandsaw is and some terminology. We talked a little bit about how a bandsaw works and uh, some theory, not a lot, but a little. But I think that it's a lot easier to show you guys how something works rather than attempt to describe it. 
So I have uh, a nice chunk of, uh, of all they're here for a body blank, and I have uh, drawn on a uh, Stratocaster body shape here, and I've been using Steve from Maximum Guitar Works um, uh, uh, template system. This has his off-body uh, off alignment pins, one here and one here, and we are going to keep those on the guitar for as long as we possibly can. We don't want to remove the off-body alignment pins until the very last second, okay? So uh, that bears repeating. We don't want to remove the off-body alignment pin holes until the very last possible time. Um, so it is very likely that we'll go, oh crap, we forgot to do something. We have to slap the templates back on. If we still have these holes, happy meal for us. Okay, so I'm gonna use the, um, the bandsaw with the 3 8 blade and I'm gonna show you how, uh, how I like to cut this stuff out. I'm gonna show you guys a handful of tips and a couple of tricks and I think that you will be, um, uh, uh, you will be able to step right in and use the bandsaw like, uh, like a boss in no time. All right, so the first thing that we want to do is we wanna get our blade guard set. We're gonna reach up and loosen the lock here and lower, lower the crank. Now we want to make sure we can actually slide under and it looks pretty good. So let's reach up and lock it down. I'm reaching through the, the yoke of the saw so you can't see my arm here. I should probably move this extension cord out of the way here. This drop from the ceiling. Okay, let's talk a little bit about safety, guys. Um, you'll notice I have a bunch of jewelry on. I'm going to remove some of that because I don't want any of it to get caught in the piece. Um, this is something that I advise you to do, and if, uh, if you don't want to, that's up to you, but it's something that I recommend that you do. Um, the next thing that you want to remember to have is your safety glasses, okay? So protect your eyes. Um, I often say protect your ears. However, I am of the opinion that the bandsaw will tell me more about what it's doing if I listen to it than if I block off all of my hearing. So uh, that is a trade-off that I have decided to make. I don't like to, um, uh, to not hear what I'm doing. Um, for the purposes of this video, we are not going to use dust collection so that I'm not constantly having to turn dust collection on and off during the video. But I advise that you use some dust collection. If you are not going to use dust collection, uh, it's not a bad idea to wear a respirator. Okay? All right, let's get, we got all the safety sallies. Um, uh, they're, they're all very happy. So if you're new to using a bandsaw and you have a body blank, I recommend that you do some practice cuts. So here's one that I usually like guys to make. Just kind of a gentle sweeping arc here. And let's try to stay on, uh, let's try to cut as close to this line as we can. I might have to move my camera to do this. The, um, the thing that we want to do when we're making any arc is we want to remember to go slow and we want to push the piece through the cut as we're turning. We want to push the piece through the cut as we're turning. If we attempt to turn the, the, the piece without pushing through, it's gonna kink the blade and potentially break it. Let me show you what I mean. I have to move the camera. That should work. Okay, all right, so we're gonna cut along this practice line here, and remember, we're going to push the piece through the cut as we turn. All right, a couple more safety things that I wanted to wait until we got to where we were using the saw to actually tell you guys about. One thing, you'll notice that this chunk of material here, I left where it is until the saw came to a complete stop, okay? If you're going to, uh, first of all, that wasn't bothering me right there. This piece could stay right here and, or, or right here. It wouldn't have bothered me in the least little bit. I could have just 
kept on sawing and no big shake. But if you really got to move it out of the way, let the saw blade come to a complete stop. You'll also notice that I'm addressing the saw from the front and I'm attempting to keep my hands as close to my body as I possibly can. That's a good rule of thumb with any power tool. Keep your hands as close to your body as you can. As soon as you start pushing stuff out here, it gets, it gets, a, little, it gets a little more dicey than it does if you're up close, okay? Um, uh, anytime your hand is in the path of the blade, you are in danger. Um, anytime a power tool can, can cut you, it will. Um, so there are some things that I like to do to mitigate that. One of them is to keep my hand anchored on the table. So if the um, resistance of the saw stops, but my forward momentum continues, I don't go shoving my hands this way into the blade. My hand goes into the table and stops right here. I can do a lot of things with my hand anchored to the table just as well as I can if my hands aren't anchored to the table, okay? So we're gonna talk about uh, like a lot of this kind of thing uh, as we go here, but um, let's, uh, let's do another practice cut and, uh, and I'll show you some more stuff. Why don't we do a straight line? Uh, in fact, why don't we do a straight line right on the edge of the, uh, of the piece here. We're gonna try to work uh, as close to this line as we can and definitely not go into the body. Here we go. Okay, I've got my hand anchored to the table and out of the line of the blade. Pretty good straight line. Remember that piece of, of, uh, of extra material that's on the table isn't gonna bother anybody, but if I really wanna get it off the table, I'm gonna wait till the blade comes to a complete stop. All right, let's use the fence a little bit. Let me show you a little bit about, about that. So we get the fence real, real close here because if we, if we run the, the saw blade uh, down this side, we don't wanna get into our body. So let's see. That might be a little too close. Let's see how good we get. Okay, so we're using the fence and, uh, and, and we're just gonna run this right along, the, right along the edge. All right, saw blades come to a complete stop. As you can see, that looks pretty good. Um, like I say, not as smooth as a table saw, but still pretty good. Okay, so we've done a straight cut here on the corner. We've done a little bit of a, of a, of a radius right here, and we've used the fence. Um, let's try an inside cut. Let's try this one here. Okay, get our fence out of the way here. Remember, we're going to go slow and we're going to push the saw blade through the cut. So not too bad. I'm not exactly on my line, but you get the idea. Okay, wait till the saw blade stops and we'll get that piece out of the way, if it's bothering you. Okay, so I think we've got a little bit of practice here. Why don't we go ahead and do the, uh, do the outline? Um, some people often ask me, where do I start? 
Well, it doesn't really matter. Um, I like to start in the easiest spot. For me, that's usually right here. So let's go ahead and we're going to work from here all the way around to where we got real close here. We might, the saw blade might pop out. So um, tell you what, let's go from this, uh, this the upper horn all the way to, to right back here. Um, we are going to uh, watch my hands, watch where they are, watch that I push the saw through the cut, watch that I go slow, I'm not going to speed the video up, and watch what happens when we get here. You'll be able to hear a difference when you are about to run out of, of room. The saw blade's going to want to come out of this cut, it's not going to want to stay here. So that's going to be a critical uh, area to, to know where you are because the resistance of the saw blade is going to stop and if your momentum keeps going you could be endangering yourself endangering yourself all right here we go see how my hand is actually in the path of the blade but my palm is resting on the on the on the table that's what you want to do Right here, I need to start anticipating this, this uh, getting out of this um, uh, radius. Okay, coming up, you're gonna hear the difference in the saw blade. All right, that looks pretty good. We're very, very close to our line, as you can see, but we haven't touched the line. That's what we wanna do. Um, if you're further away than that, that's okay. Um, we're gonna we're gonna spend a bunch more time cleaning that up with uh, uh, the the either the router table, the pin router, or the edge sander. But the more stuff you can turn into a big chunk of wood like this, and the less that you'd have to turn into powder, the better. All right, let's continue on down this way and see if we can get to right at this lower, lower waist portion here. Coming into a cut like this is a little tricky. You kind of have to make a notch because the blade wants to skip out. So you have to go a little slow, make a little notch, and then uh, get to just to get started. Here's what I mean.
where it gets very, very dangerous because the saw blade is about to jump out or it could stay in. So remember to keep your hands safe. You're in the path of the blade. You don't want to go screaming your hands into that thing or it will cut you. Okay, so uh, this is not a big deal. Uh, we did a great job here all the way through on these very um, uh, uh, kind of loose radiuses here. Now we're gonna get to the tighter stuff. Um, there's a couple of different ways that I like to do this, and I'm gonna show you both of them right now. The first of which is we're gonna work on this lower cutaway. I like to make a cut straight in, parallel to my neck pocket, and then that allows me to pull the blade straight out. Next, I like to come in and get rid of all of this material here. Sometimes you can even do a little bit of a radius here. Okay, now we still have to get rid of all of this stuff. And we can do it exactly the same way if we go slow. Remember, I'm pushing through the cut as I'm turning. You can see I'm going to be able to make it from here to here. Okay, now if we want to, we can clean this up. And that looks pretty good. While I was cutting this, I told you guys that I can see that I'm going to be able to make this connection here. I knew that I was gonna be able to intersect with this, um, this relief cut that I made. But what if you don't think you're gonna be able to do that? Then you can, use, um, you can use a technique where you have a bunch more relief cuts than, you, than we had with just this one. Let me show you that now. The first thing that I wanna do is I wanna clean up the end of my neck pocket. And we might as well see if we can get rid of, of that as well, okay? Since those are both straight cuts, we'll be able to push in and pull out again. Remember, your eighth grade shop teacher would be very disappointed if he saw you doing this. But it's my tool, I can do whatever I want. So 
Straight in and straight out. All right, now the majority of that meat is gone. What we want to do is we want to try to get this radius. Um, there are a couple ways that you can do this. One way that I like to do is put in some relief cuts here. And you don't need to draw these in, but for the purposes of the demonstration of this video, I thought that would be a good idea. Um, and let's do one right there too. So we want to keep the off-body alignment pin. So you'll notice I didn't go parallel to these other lines. I just did one right here. So we'll be able to cut, 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 and get to this relief one here. All right, so let's just go ahead and do those straight in and straight out. demonstration purposes only. I'm not advising that you do this. I'm going to make a very, very thin one right here. Okay, now we can go ahead and start to connect these. You'll notice that when I get from, uh, from my Initial start cut to the end of my uh, relief there, that piece will just fall out of the way. There we go, see, it fell right out of the way. It did exactly what I wanted to. Remember what I said about all the other pieces that are not gonna get in the way? This guy is absolutely gonna get in the way, okay? and. Remember to let the blade come to a complete stop before you go flicking at it. And in fact, even when the blade's completely stopped, it's not a bad idea to have a little push stick to help get that out of the way, okay? So these guys won't get in the way. That guy will. <laughs> Here comes this little piece here. So the little piece here, I was hoping that that would fall back into the blade, but fortunately that already happened with the triangle cut that we made originally. So you gotta watch out for, you gotta watch out for little slivers like this because they'll fall into the blade guard guide or the blade, the blade, uh, the thing on the table, whatever it is, and um, they'll, they'll get you all dorked up. See how this guy is flicking about? Go ahead and let that, let that sit. Stop your tool, and when everything's nice and slowed down and stopped, then you can reach in and get those pieces out of the way. Okay, that actually looks pretty good. Um, we'll clean up this area here around the off-body alignment pin. And that should be good. I know, I started, I put my pencil in here and the tool was still running and I'm like, geez, I can't believe I did that on camera in front of everybody. Guys, what I just did there, we have plenty of time. You don't need to start flicking pieces out of the way. Let the saw come to a complete stop and let's be safe about this. And then uh, at the end of the day, we'll, uh, we'll be able to sit back and have a really good time and, and 
talk about all the fun we had using, using power tools. So I'm going to leave that in the video, but yeah, don't go grabbing and reaching in for, um, for pieces to flick out of the way. Um, I do it myself, resist the temptation. Guys, did you enjoy the bandsaw part? Okay, cool. If you did, you might want to give me the thumbs up or um, even hit the subscribe button. If you appreciate content like this, please consider going over to our Patreon page or joining us on YouTube. Even a buck a month goes a long way to helping us bring you guys cool content like this. If you can't do that though, uh, just share the video as many places as you can possibly imagine and help us grow the channel that way. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Flipside Music, the great American guitar store, Steve at Maximum Guitar Works, Dylan McCurty from Dylan Talks Tone, uh, John and Cheryl from Bitterroot Guitars, Dan and Calvin from Tonewood Experts, and Chris and Dina from Odyssey Beer Works, and uh, all the other people who support us, like you guys. Uh, and if you know anybody at uh, Rock and Vodka, let uh, Rick Nielsen know that uh, that we're supporting him too. <laughs> who knows? Maybe we could get one of the coolest guitar collectors in the world to come to the shop one day. All right. Um, so anyway, let's jump over to the pin router and show you what that's like. All right, anyone who has watched my channel for any length of time will know that the pin router is one of my favorite tools. Um, I've made videos about nothing but the pin router, and um, it's kind of a specialty tool these days, but back in the old days, pin routers were everywhere where you were using wood in a production setting. Cool? Um, so what it does is it allows you to follow patterns quickly and efficiently, and um, it's, a, it's a terrific tool for guitar builders. It's a classic tool for guitar builders. You guys know all that stuff. Um, I have a couple of them. Actually, there's three pin routers in the, in the shop right now. Uh, there's a couple of these jet units and a grizzly unit. Now, before you get all excited, um, the jet unit that I, that is not this one, uh, but let's go see it. So here is my grizzly pin router and uh, it is an excellent tool. And uh, my friend Brian Nutter actually um, sold his pin router, and this is it. It is uh, being restored by my friend Brandon. He bought it from Brian. And uh, one day, this will be uh, a fully operational, fully restored jet pin router. So all the pin routers that I have in my shop all work the same way. So if you come to a workshop, you'll be able to go from one to the next, and they all work uh, almost exactly the same way. Some cranks go backward from the other and things like that. But um, all these pin routers have a pneumatic ram. The table stays fixed and you can raise the cutting head with the crank on the side, which we're gonna get to. Um, <clears throat> but for the purposes of this video, I want to remind you that if you come to one of our workshops, you're gonna be on this machine like day one. This is day one stuff. Um, okay, so. Let's jump in and talk a little bit about the, uh, um, how the pin router works and then let's show it off because that's the cool stuff. All right, lately I've been getting a bunch of e YouTube comments and emails about, boy, I can't believe you're able to freehand that as well as you are. Well, the fact of the matter is I'm not freehanding it. I'm taking advantage of the way this tool was designed and, um, and it might look like I'm freehanding it, but I'm not. What's actually happening is this pin right here is my guide. So the way that a pin router works is, it's actually called a pin router because of this pin. And this is your uh, bearing guide or your template guide. So the center of this pin is the same as the center of this cutting head. And the diameter of this pin is the same as the diameter of this cutting bit. So what happens is, if you have a template and you move it around the bearing or the pin and you lower this cutter head into the piece, you impart a cut onto the workpiece. Don't worry, I'm gonna show you all of this stuff. With the pattern cutting bit with the bearing attached, I can cut around a pattern and the cut will be exactly the same size as my bearing. If you were gonna use um, this style of bit to do say a rabbit cut, that is to say, uh, a, you know, like a little notch for binding say, since we're building guitars, let's use, let's use that, we're, we're, we're putting binding on, you would need to have a bearing that is a different size than the cutter, okay? 
Um, and you could you could probably find a bearing and and move it around on on this this um, this pattern bit. Or if you buy the the rabbit cutting bits for binding from Stu Mac, you can switch bearing sizes and get different sizes of binding. The neat thing about a pin router, yeah, is because the pin is not attached to the bit, I can change out to a different size pin. In this case, I put a quarter inch pin in, um, in my slot. The nice thing is the center is still the center, but now I'm cutting a bigger path with my cutter head than I was when, the, when I had the same size um, pin as my, as my cutting tool. This will come in handy for say things like um, if you have templates that are slightly oversized or you have say a neck that is slightly undersized and you want to make your neck pocket a little tighter or make your neck fit a little more snug. Back in the old days when I was doing this with a hand router, we would wrap tape around the template. And in fact, many places sell you templates and recommend that you wrap tape around the template to, uh, to fit, you know, to fit the, um, the various, like if this were a neck pocket, you'd have to imagine. You make your neck pocket snug. Well, what I can do with the pin router is I can actually do the same thing. I can wrap tape around the pin, which is essentially exactly the same thing as wrapping it around the, um, uh, the, the template and, uh, and, and use this and, and have no, no real issues. The other cool thing is it's tricky to wrap tape around, around a bearing because it's gonna start spinning at 20,000 RPM right away. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so the pin router is a super, super effective tool for stuff like that. Let's dive in and let me show you some of the mechanics of the pin router. This crank will raise and lower the cutting head almost four inches. We're going to go ahead and raise it all the way up so you can see. You can actually watch it raise and lower on this scale here. So we're as high as the cutting head can go. We can also lower it. I'm not going to go all the way down, but we can lower this head assembly all the way down. So we have four inches of travel with just the head assembly alone. The pin router also has a pneumatic ram. So you can imagine, with all of the travel in the head assembly as well as the travel in the pneumatic ram assembly, we can do all sorts of cuts with all different sizes of templates and all different uh, uh, thicknesses of, of material. We can also take very little off at a time or we can take quite a bit off at a time, which I'm going to show you here in a moment. Um, but before we do, I want to talk about the, uh, how the pneumatic ram assembly works and how I want you to make sure to remember to use it once you're here. This is the belt assembly and this is the pneumatic ram operating inside the, uh, uh, the, the cover here. This green deal is the belt and you can actually see the belt rotating around as I spin the tool. What you may not see is behind the belt, on the other side of the belt, the drive side of the belt, is a great big drum that is um, uh, about five or six inches tall. And what happens is, is when everything is spinning, this belt moves up and down on the drive drum in the back that's five or six inches tall. If everything is spinning, then everything moves up and down perfectly and works great. If 
the drive wheel is not spinning and you operate the pneumatic ram, it kinks the belt. So what has to happen is this spindle needs to be spinning in order for you to move the pneumatic head as ram assembly up or down. I'm going to show you what that looks like now. The pneumatic ram assembly also has some built-in stops right here. You'll notice that this dial, when you're here, you'll be able to see the dial, has one, two, three, four, five, six different settings. They allow the ram to go only so far down. If you're on the one setting, that restricts the movement the most. If you're on the six setting, that restricts the movement the least. That means that one is the shallowest cut and six is the deepest cut. This stopper actually stops on this bolt head here because everything's adjustable and it is possible to get them in between, meaning that this stopper will go in between and go considerably deeper than you had originally intended. So make sure that you stop on the detent. You can lock the pneumatic ram assembly from moving by twisting this bolt here. You can actually see the bolt move in and out and block the ram assembly. This is a very low tech operation. The foot switch for the pin router seems to stymie a lot of people. It's a pretty low tech deal too. When you come out and use the pin router, um, if you have great big feet, it's going to be really tricky because this shield only allows so much foot to get in. Um, if you have great big shoes, same deal. If you're a regular size human, uh, you won't have any trouble. The idea is that you want to press down on the tip of this switch and this guy right here, this plastic piece, operates as a latch that goes over and locks the foot switch down. I'm going to show you what that looks like now. As you can imagine, if you put your whole foot in here, you can press down on this switch, but you'll also negate the operation of the latch. So I see a lot of people press in, press in, press in, and the, the ram doesn't stay down. That's why. Just press on the tip of the switch all the way to the floor and it will stay locked. When it's time to raise the ram up, you need to just kick this little plastic piece out of the way. Okay, last thing I want to talk about before we start cutting wood is the stop and start button you will notice that the stop button is pressed all the way in and if it is, the start button doesn't actually do anything. First, I need to unlock the stop button. There's a little ring around the stop button. If I just twist it a little bit, the stop button will pop out. See? You can grab the stop button and yank it out, but that'll break it. So, you just want to twist the little ring. That bears repeating. Twist the little ring. Twist the little ring. So if the stop button is depressed, the start button won't do anything. If you twist the little ring, the start button will activate the machine. Alright, you guys ready to start using the pin router? I've got my uh, Maximum Guitar Works template attached to my body blank here. I'm going to put the template on the table. So everything you kind of have to work upside down. <laughs> the template's going to go on the table and the pin is going to act as the bearing surface for the template. So the, I'm going to move the piece around the template attached to the pin and it's going to impart my cut. Now, a couple of things I want you guys to keep in mind. The closer your hands are to your body, the better. Remember to remove any jewelry that you're wearing or anything like that. You don't want to get sucked up into the tool. Um, keep your hands as close to your body as you can with any power tool. 
Um, the further your hands go out this way, the, the higher the likelihood of something bad happening in relation to your hands or your arms in the high speed cutting tool. So if you keep your hands close to your body, that's going to mean that you need to angle or rotate the piece, right? Because if you didn't, this sort of thing would happen. All right, that should make perfect sense. Keep your hands close to your body and rotate the piece. Now, when I say rotate the piece, I don't mean like this. I mean all the way. When you're at a workshop, if I say rotate the piece, I don't mean like this. I don't mean just a little bit. I mean 90 degrees or more, okay? When you're at one of our workshops, if you hear this word, when you're at one of our workshops, if you hear this phrase, rotate the piece, I don't mean one degree, I don't mean five degrees, I probably mean 90 degrees. Okay, keep the piece moving and rotate the piece. All right, we're going to rotate the piece. See how I rotated it? A full 90 degrees. All right. It is very likely that I will have a stick right here, meaning your hands do not need to cross that line. Um, don't worry, it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, let's do the outline of this guitar from the back, or at least some of it. Protect your eyes, protect your ears. If you need a face mask, now's a good time to do it.
when you're here at one of our workshops, always let the tool spindle all the way down and come to a complete stop before moving your piece off the table. A good rule of thumb to use with a pin router or any router is to vary the depth of your cut to no deeper than half the diameter of the bit. So that means that since we have a half inch cutting tool, we should probably limit the depth of our cut to a quarter inch or less. The nice thing is with the pin router, we can absolutely vary it to a 16th or a 32nd, or even in some cases, an inch or, or more. Um, of course, it depends on the wood, but like I say, it's just a good rule of thumb. Okay, so I've showed you how we do the exterior cuts uh, or the outside. Now, let's show you some of the cool things the pin router can do when it comes to plunge cutting. Steve built these templates for use with any router, so a regular hand router will work great. But I don't think he even realized that just how awesome they are for pin routers. So we can go right from the external cut here to, in this case, the control cavity. We'll go ahead and put this control cavity cover uh, route in and uh, it will go on the back. Since we're making a right-handed guitar, we want the cover to be on the front. So I'm going to show you how we do the, uh, um, a plunge cut on the pin router. I like to raise the head assembly all the way up and make sure I'm on the uh, shallowest cut on the little dial here. Um, since this is the, 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 the cut that we're going to do on this one is just going to be an eighth inch deep to accommodate for the control cavity cover. It's not going to be too deep. It's actually going to be quite shallow. An eighth of an inch or so. So as you can imagine, the pin router will do everything that we need to do to make this body just about. Um, we'll do the perimeter cut, we'll do all of the cuts for our control cavity, we'll do our pickup routes, we'll do our neck pocket, and we'll get everything just perfectly right. Um, we'll just follow a couple of easy to follow rules and we'll be totally safe. Uh, this pin router spins at 10,000 RPM, so it's slower than your regular hand router. Um, the other neat thing is, we know for a fact that this bit isn't going anywhere. So we, if we keep our hands close to our body, we'll be totally safe. You can see probably uh, how the pin router is a really excellent tool to, uh, to have in any guitar shop. And like I say, if you come to one of our workshops, you get to use it on day one. So guys, every single guitar that we make here at our shop, we use the bandsaw and the pin router for so much of the woodwork. So you can see why they are super cool tools to have at, uh, at your disposal if you come to one of our workshops or if you just have your own guitar building shop. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video about bandsaw basics and pin router basics. We look forward to seeing you guys at one of our build workshops. And until then, this is Matt at Texas Toast reminding you that if you're so smart, start your own YouTube channel. That's what I did. Thanks for watching, you guys. We'll see you next time.